Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Bobby Payne claimed to have discovered a strange ten-toed footprint in a muddy field in the summer. He described it as looking like two human hands laid one atop the other and pressed into the mud, leaving what appeared to be no less than ten-toe impression. He also claimed to have chased a small black panther the previous summer. All of this unexplained activity hasn't kept Payne and his family away, however. On the weekend of February 13th and 14th, Bobby and his wife were at a campsite in the evening enjoying the peace and quiet. A barred owl had arrived a short while earlier, and Bobby amused himself by calling to the bird and hearing it call back to him. This happened several times when the bird suddenly went quiet. After several more fruitless attempts, a frightening shriek suddenly erupted from the darkened woods around them. It sounded like an ape screaming. Then we heard what sounded like something beating on the ground with its fist. Once again, they opted to leave the area as quickly as they could and didn't return for two more weeks. Then the first daylight sighting of the creature occurred at around 1 p.m. on the afternoon of February 28th. I received a call from Mr. Payne informing me that both himself and his wife had just observed the creature at the campsite. According to him, they were walking around the foundation of the old haunted house site when they heard a grunt come from the underbrush about 40 yards away. They turned and saw what they described as a seven to eight foot tall man-like creature stand up from behind a tree. This thing stood up, grabbed the tree with one hand, and started shaking it violently, Payne said. The whole tree. Then it turned and ran upright into the woods. Payne's wife told me that she thought she was going to have a heart attack when she saw it. I've never been so scared in all my life, she said. By the time the thing ran away, the couple were running as well, in the direction of their truck. I was at the site less than two hours after the sighting occurred, but the creature itself was nowhere to be seen. I was able to interview the two witnesses and photograph the scene of the occurrence and the tree it allegedly shook. The immediate area of the sighting is compromised of heavy cover, small trees and bushes amid very thick underbrush and briars. The investigation of this case is ongoing. On to the next one. My brother and I had a very frightening experience in South Mills, Kentucky, just two miles above south of Geneva. There is a place in Smith Mills, Henderson County, Kentucky, called Burbanks Lake, also known locally as Spooky Hill. As you might guess by the name, down through the years, this particular spot has garnered a reputation for being haunted. I believe it to be a window location as many inexplicable experiences have taken place in this area, including various cryptid sightings such as Bigfoot, water monsters, giant birds, and black panthers. UFO activity is not uncommon in this area, and there are many ghost stories associated with Spook Hill as well. Lending to this aura of mystery, no doubt, is the fact that there are two very old cemeteries long since reclaimed by the forest to be found at the hilltop, also situated there between the main cemetery and the slave cemetery are three ancient lakes. One is fairly big and deep, and all were rumored for as long as I could remember to contain monster baths. 
The male members of my family have always been avid fishermen. So, one day, back in the summer of 1987, we all decided to go there and fish there. This was totally against our dad's better judgment. He had lived near the area when he was younger and had been personally warned by Mr. Burbank never to let the dark catch him on the property. He never said why. Also, my older half-brother, Harold, had told us a scary story about a time when he and a brother-in-law had went night fishing there in a boat a few years before. He claimed that every time the two tried to land the boat and come ashore to leave, the woods would erupt with the sound of breaking branches and heavy footsteps, forcing them to shove back out into the lake. It sounded like a herd of elephants was tromping around in there, he had said. Every attempt to leave the lake was met by this resistance which frightened them both, and they were forced to spend the entire night in the boat out in the middle of the lake. Only when dawn broke were the two allowed to leave, which they did all in haste never to return. This intrigued me to no end, green as I was back then, but the lure of trophy bass enticed us all. We arrived at the lake in the early afternoon and headed through the trees down to the water. We had been able to produce a one-man bass boat with a small trolling motor from a friend. It could hold two people, but just barely. As there were six of us, four brothers and two friends, this meant that four would be confined to fishing from the banks. We found the place to be absolutely teeming with water moccasins, and not one of us had brought a weapon of any type only fishing poles. Since everyone wanted to fish the other side of the lake, we opted to be ferried across one by one rather than walk through the tall grass trying to avoid a possible snake bite. It took forever for the little motor to chug everyone across the lake. By the time we made it to the other side, it was already late afternoon. The sun was making a rapid disappearance behind the trees. We fished a while without much luck. I remember catching one large mouth that weighed a couple of pounds, and before we knew it, darkness was fast approaching. My older brother, who had been hogging the bass boat with a family friend, finally sputtered in to shore and began taking everyone back across one at a time. This took around 30 to 40 minutes round trip, with five trips to be made. Complete darkness fell with just myself and one of my younger brothers remaining on the far side of the lake. We had half a gallon of kerosene and had earlier gathered what wood we could find, which was mostly wet since it had rained there a couple of days previously, and used it to build a small fire. We were sitting there bemoaning so much trouble for nothing when the sound of breaking branches and heavy footsteps erupted from the woods in front of us. It was a terrifyingly loud commotion, and we jumped up in fright. I have never before or since been so terrified by any type of sound. It was, looking back, totally unlike me to react in such a manner. Perhaps it was because at the first limb fracture, we both knew immediately what was out there in the darkness of those haunted woods. Worse, the sound soon became to come from behind us and to our right as well, and they were getting closer. We heard no grunts, no growl, no breathing, just the heavy footfalls and the terrific explosions of cracking tree limbs all around us. We thought we were both going to die that night, without a doubt, and I count myself lucky to have made it out of there alive. We could see nothing, as it was quite dark, no moon and heavy cloud cover. When the sounds got quite close, I threw some kerosene into the fire, determined to at least see what was about to eat us. The fuel ignited, 
and the fire flared up, illuminating an area of about 25 radial feet in all directions. We saw nothing. The light would only last for a few seconds, then it would subside and plunge our surroundings back into utter darkness. When this happened, the sound would start up and approach us again. Over and over, I threw the fuel into the shrinking fire, washing the woods in sudden firelight. When I did this, all the sounds immediately stopped. We never did see a thing, not even a single eye shine. The kerosene didn't last too long. We had been yelling and making a good-sized noise of our own to no avail. It seemed that only the light was holding our would-be attackers at bay, but the fire was fading fast. Soon, it was reduced to a tiny flame at one end of a small, wet branch, and the noises were closing in once again. The smaller the branch became, the closer the ungodly racket approached. I grabbed the burnt twig and held it up in front of me as we walked backwards down toward the water's edge. I told my brother to get ready to swim for his life. The noises followed us down to the lake, even though this area had very few trees. It sounded like invisible branches were being broken by invisible beings. Lucky for us, just as we were about to get wet, we heard the sound of our brother on the boat shouting his approach. We yelled for him to hurry. When he reached us, we were in a state of agitation to say the least. He wanted to know who was next. Well, to put it simply, we found out a one-man boat can actually carry three people in an emergency. On to the next one. Mary stood by the sink, washing dishes, hands working methodically at their chore, in the kitchen of a small country farmhouse. It was Saturday, and she was 12 years old, dressed in simple garments and well-worn leather shoes. Her pigtails bounced as she dried and stacked the plate. She was alone. Midday was approaching, and from the small window in front of her came the sounds of the peaceful day outside. The birds chirped. A gentle breeze stirred through the branches of the nearby forest, and the faint sounds of the rushing river. Peaceful sounds which belied her family's troubled stay there. Her mother and older brother, Herman, had gone into town for groceries while she'd elected to stay behind and finish her chores. Neither of them liked the idea, but she insisted she would be all right. She was almost grown now. Suddenly, the sounds outside ceased, and a heavy silence fell. It only lasted a second before a mighty wind hit her in the face and blew the curtains and her pigtails straight out. She gasped and turned away, only to see that all the curtains in the house were blowing inward, even the ones in front of closed windows. The back door flew violently inward as well and slammed against the wall, and she plainly heard the front door do the same, though she could not see it from where she stood. Her face was pale as the wind died down, and she stood there for a second. Staring at the doorway to the living room, and hardly daring to breathe, something was in there she knew. In the living room, something terrible, something horrible. She could feel it looking at her through the walls, and the drawing of that awful realization filled her with such utter despair and dread, the likes of which she could scarcely have imagined existed in her young life. She took a fearful step toward the door. She didn't know why. She didn't want to. She was scared, so scared. Her feet were moving of their own will, and she couldn't make them stop. Tears began to spill from her eyes, and she clenched her fist as, after a seeming eternity, she stepped into the doorway. She screamed when it came into view, the monster in the living room. It was huge and covered with dark hair, so tall that it was bent over nearly double to avoid the room's eight-foot ceiling. Its claws were like daggers. Mary screamed again when their eyes met. Through her tears, she could see that they glowed an evil red, and that with each deep, ragged breath, 
Blue fire was coming from the monster's nostrils and mouth. She fainted then, mercifully. Her mother and brother were mildly annoyed at first when they'd arrived home and found that every window and door on the house was locked up tight. Her annoyance quickly turned to anger and then fear at the harder she'd had Herman beat on the door with no answer. Just before panic set in, she told her son to break the glass. Once the door was unlocked, they rushed inside, shouting, Mary, Mary. At length, they found her hiding behind the couch, suffering from a shock and unable to speak. In the middle of the living room floor, impressed into the linoleum rug, was the imprint of a gigantic footprint 24 inches long. The next day, the family abandoned the isolated farmhouse, never to return. This incident happened in 1935 and took place in the exact same farmhouse my family moved into 40 years later. But there was much monster activity during that 40-year span. Before the big flood of 37, Herman Snodgrass, Mary's brother, said in the late 1980s, there used to be a little town down there in the bottoms. It had a little church and even a small one-room schoolhouse, but people didn't stay long. That monster ran most of them off. After the flood, only a few houses had remained intact. Hardly no one had bothered to move back. The town no longer existed. Our house was one of the few, and people moved in and out at a steady pace during the following years. I'm sure each of them had their own experiences, and I was able to trace some residents to that address back, all with stories to tell. Ironically, my own parents were warned about the creature by the previous tenants. The man of the house had fired numerous rounds through the back screen door at a big, hairy fella standing outside in the yard. On to the next one. On the day I had my sighting, my girlfriend and I had decided to take a hike up to the fire lookout station atop Shadow Mountain. The hike began from the Grand Lake entrance area. We soon found ourselves wrapping around the lake with Shadow Mountain in full view. In hindsight, I would highly recommend wearing bug spray when walking near the lake. It was something that we did not have that day, and boy, did we pay for it. The mosquitoes were absolutely brutal at times as we were close to the water's edge. Once we were clear of the area, we started heading directly towards the mountain itself and its ascending trail. By the time we were midway up the mountain trail, we had already seen a bear and several deer, as well as many chipmunks and what I believe was a mink or something of the sort. Once you are beyond the midway point, the trail becomes quite steep. There were a lot of trees across the trail that day, which made things quite difficult for us. Nevertheless, we had made it to the top. We approached the lookout with relief, but were disappointed. To our dismay, the tower staircase was locked, keeping us from climbing up onto it. Basically, it's a fairly short tower made from stone with painted brown logs forming a deck base up on the top, upon which a small hut-like structure is attached to it. So we sat up there for about an hour or two, enjoying the views from every side of the mountain. It was actually breathtaking, and I would highly recommend it to anyone with a good pair of legs. The trees in this area are predominantly some type of narrow-growing pines, which I believe are spruce. A fair amount of them are dead, which creates a type of screen to the eyes as you are peering about on the trail. We had actually seen bears and deer walking about in this timber screening as we were on our way up to the lookout station. 
it gave the appearance of something walking behind a stockade fence with every other slat removed. What I am trying to do here is to set the stage for you visually for what we were about to see on our descent from Shadow Mountain. The three of us had just passed the steepest section as we were making our way down the slope. It was right about that time when my girlfriend, Trisha, said, Look guys, there's another bear down there. As we all turned our heads to look, I think that Trisha realized at the same time that we all did that this wasn't a bear, but rather a Bigfoot. At first glance, this was an easy mistake to make because of the broken field of vision created by all of the dead gray trees. We were quite a bit higher than this creature that was walking through the trees down and away off to our right-hand side. We weren't making any noise other than walking. Otherwise, I am sure it would have spied us out, but it hadn't. This Bigfoot was on a mission because it didn't stop for a second as it was walking. When we first saw it, I believe we were maybe three or four hundred feet away from it, and we were able to get some fairly good looks as it traversed the slope. The only way it could have seen us would have been to look up and over its left shoulder, which it thankfully didn't do. At the place we were on the trail, there was really nowhere to hide, so we just quietly stood our ground and watched. This thing was moving very quickly through the tightly packed pines, and we could see the treetops rocking back and forth as it parted them, making its way through, using its arms and hands to clear the path. I would say that most of the trees in here were between, say, 12 and 25 feet. The Bigfoot measured up as being pretty damn tall in our estimation. It was an incredible sight to behold, and no, it wasn't a man in a monkey suit. One of the most bothersome things about having a sighting like this is the after effect of how you are perceived by your peers, having told them of your experience. Speaking for myself, I was as high as a kite for weeks after the sighting and anxious to tell everyone and anyone about what I had seen, but those euphoric feelings soon dwindled away as I saw and heard the reactions of those with whom I spoke. It's really a crying shame that people choose to be so ignorant about these things. However, that coming from someone's perspective who had just seen one. I'm not sure how I would have reacted had you told me of your experience, but I'd like to think that I would have responded in a better way than most. On to the next one. I was living in Arizona at the time of this story. In my mind, one of the most unlikely places to ever even think of Bigfoot, yet alone see one. It was in Prescott, so maybe there's enough forested area around there for them to live. But Bigfoot was a new concept for me, I can tell you that. We had a nice place on the edge of town right in the Ponderosa Pines with a big deck that went halfway around the house. It was a nice spot. My wife and I have since retired and moved back to Colorado, where we're originally from. Well, one day I was sitting on the deck when I spotted something out of the corner of my eye back in the trees. At the time, a cougar had been coming around so I was pretty aware of movement. The cougar had actually dragged a dog from its yard, although the owner had managed to scare it off and rescue the dog, but just barely. So I was just sitting there, drinking my morning coffee, thinking about some stuff at work. I was a college professor and half asleep when I saw this movement back in the trees. I'm not one to defy nature, so I got up and went inside. If it was a cougar, I wasn't taking any chances. I also wanted to grab my camera and see if I could get a good shot of one, if that's what it was. 
So I was running into the kitchen where I'd put my camera on the table, then running back around to the living room where I'd been sitting outside on the deck when I saw something for sure running out the window. But it appeared to be running away from the house, only maybe 30 feet from the deck. Had it come up to the house? If so, how did it turn around and retreat that fast? I couldn't believe it. It looked like the tail end of something huge, but I only got a glimpse before it was back in the pines. It was dark brown except for the bottoms of its feet, which, as it picked them up running, I could see were lighter in color. It had really wide shoulders, like someone wearing shoulder pads would have. I did have the presence of mind to take a photo, which I later showed to my daughter, who's a semi-pro photographer, and she was pretty shook up. Like all Bigfoot photos, it wasn't real definitive, just a black, blurry object. But given the story that it went with, it was proof enough for me. As this thing ran away, I was standing there in shock, and I could actually hear the timber breaking as it ran through, crushing branches and all. And man, it was as fast as a greased pig, which I've never seen, but I hear are fast. So I stood there for a bit, then it dawned on me to go outside and see if there were any tracks or anything. I was scared to death, but it had obviously run away, so I figured I would just look around a bit and stay close to the house. Maybe I could get some good photos, if there were print. It would make people more likely to believe me. I'll be darned if I opened the door and almost stepped on something. I was shocked. It was a little kitten, maybe about two months old, Huddled there, a gray and white long-haired tabby with the cutest little lynx-like face. I stood there for a minute, wondering where it had come from and why it didn't run away when I noticed it was twisted all weird. It then started meowing, this tiny little meow, and trying to stand up. It could pull itself up with its front paws, but its rear end just dragged along behind it. It was injured, and maybe pretty seriously. Oh, jeez. What the heck? Where did this little thing come from? Was there some relationship to this and what I swear looked like a Bigfoot? There had to be. It was no coincidence. And the kitten had to be carried and put there. No way could it move itself. I'd been sitting there just moments ago, so even if it did manage to drag itself up onto the porch, I would have noticed it. Did the Bigfoot injure it? Was it trying to get help for the kitten? I went inside and got a small towel and carefully kind of rolled the kitten onto the towel and then very gently wrapped it up and took it inside. I offered it some water and it was very thirsty. I didn't want to feed it as I knew it would maybe need surgery right away. So I found a small box and made a little bed for it and headed for the car. The kitten stank to high heaven, a strong odor of skunk or something really rancid. As I went outside, that same odor floated through the air. I can tell you, this really gave me pause. Truthfully, I was scared to even walk out to my car. As I drove down the lane and out to the highway, I dialed my vet and told them I was on my way. Since I have two dogs, golden retrievers, both with my wife that day, I knew the vet. I quickly got the kitten there, where they examined it and said they needed to take x-rays to see what was wrong, but they suspected a broken pelvis. Okay by me, I would figure out the bill later, you can't let creatures suffer. It wasn't long until the vet came out into the waiting room and confirmed a broken pelvis, and on top of that, the little guy had a partially crushed hip joint. The vet said the pelvis couldn't be repaired, but it would heal naturally if we kept the kitten restricted, but they could repair the joint. The vet also wondered why the cat smelled so bad. Of course, I wasn't sure then, although I now know. I said goodbye to the little fellow and went home, knowing it was in capable hands, but before I left, they asked me what his name was. So I just off the cuff came up with Charlie. So Charlie it was. They did the surgery the next day, then called me in the afternoon to tell me Charlie was doing well, but they wanted to keep him for a few days and make sure he would be okay. In the meantime, my wife, Carrie, came home 
and I told her all about it. By then, I had loaded the photo of the Bigfoot onto my computer. She didn't like this story one bit, and I could tell she was both scared and incredulous. But I just didn't know what to say. Like most of my life, I was just a passenger on the bus. Carrie had gotten where she wouldn't let the dogs go outside without standing there watching them, even though we had a fenced yard, and I figured that was a good idea, given the cougar had tried to carry off a dog not too far away. But now, Carrie was even more nervous, and I have to admit, I was too. I made sure all the doors were locked, then had to kind of laugh at myself. What I'd seen leaving the yard, well, no lock on earth would stop that beast. That night, I swear, I could hear something talking to me, and it woke me up. I just lay there, really still and quiet, and I could hear it again, a voice, saying something in a language I didn't speak. It was coming from the deck, and it seemed like it was sad, although why I felt that, I have no idea. Shoot, was I terrified. Carrie was still asleep, but the dogs were under the bed, growling, but really quietly, like they didn't want anyone to know they were there. Like you would if you were hiding from a predator, and yet trying to be defensive. That confirmed that I wasn't dreaming. I lay there a bit then decided I had to go see what it was. My family's safety was my responsibility. I'm not a hunter, so I didn't have any kind of weapons, but I went anyways. Maybe I did it for my own sanity, I don't know. I didn't turn on any of the lights, just very softly crept into the living room, keeping along near the wall where I could sort of sneak up to the window and look out into the dark. Believe me, I felt nothing like a hero which is what you're supposed to be when you do something brave while you're scared to death. I felt more like a fool. The dogs, brave as they are, stayed under the bed. I very quietly looked out onto the deck, but there was nothing there. The voice was gone, and I was beginning to think it was all a dream, but I could feel my own hand shaking. I finally got the courage to turn on the deck light, and that's when I saw it. Something was on the deck. It kind of looked like a basket. My first thought was, oh no, not another kitten. I knew it was utterly stupid to open the door and go out there, but I had to see what it was. Maybe it was some kind of bait and I would be a goner as soon as I stepped out, but I went anyway. The first thing I noticed was that smell again. It was so powerful, it nearly knocked me over. I slowly stepped out to where the basket thing was and picked it up, expecting to be attacked by something, but wasn't. I didn't want to take it inside, as it really stank, but I wanted to see it better, so I stepped into the living room and turned on the light. It was indeed a basket, and though a rough one, made perhaps by large hands that couldn't really do fine work, it looked like it was made from dried sumac, and inside was a dead fish, smelly dead fish, maybe a small carp. The combination of the dead fish and the skunky smell almost made me throw up. Now, Carrie was coming into the living room, asking what was going on. I didn't say a word, and when she saw the basket and the dead fish, she got really quiet. Let's put it in the basement for now, she said, where we can't smell it. Wrap it in plastic. Why not back outside, I asked. It's a gift. We don't want to refuse it, she answered. A gift? From the Bigfoot. Needless to say, neither of us got any sleep. We sat in the dark and listened for weird noises scared to death. But we also talked about the whole situation. Why did the Bigfoot bring the kitten to us? Carrie was convinced it was being a good Samaritan and saving it. I wasn't so sure. I know I just wanted to go get a motel room and never come back, at least not at night. This whole thing was getting really weird. The next day, I called the vet to check on Charlie. He was doing great, but of course, it was too soon for him to come home. I then asked what they thought would cause an injury like that. Had Charlie possibly been manhandled by something big? I think the vet thought my question was a bit strange, but he answered that it was without a doubt caused by getting run over. A car had run over Charlie. It was a very common injury when cars and cats met. I pondered this a bit and shared it with Carrie when she got home from work. She was now even more convinced Bigfoot had found Charlie and brought him to us for help, then brought us a gift in thanks. 
I found it hard to believe we were even having that conversation. I pride myself on having a scientific bent. A few days ago, neither of us even believed in Bigfoot, especially not one out in Arizona. And now we were talking about Bigfoot Samaritans, how quickly things change. The next night, all was quiet. Although at one point I heard the dogs growling, but only for a moment. Carrie and I kind of huddled together all night long, neither of us getting much sleep. We were terrified and our house was no longer our refuge. I was actually wishing I'd seen a cougar instead of a Bigfoot. The next day, I went to the university and Carrie went to work, leaving the dogs locked in the house for the day. The doggy door closed. I ran home between classes and let them out. Finally, the next day, it was time for Charlie to come home. My wife had bought a small cat carrier and picked him up after work, as I was too busy. I hated to see what the vet bill was, but it actually was pretty reasonable, and Charlie's prognosis was good. Since he was so young, he would heal fine, but we had to keep him contained for several months so his pelvis could heal. He could hang around the house with us, but for short stretches only at first, and the rest of the time he was to be in this big metal carrier they loaned us. Carrie set the carrier up in the living room where Charlie could see us and be part of the family. We fed him and took turns holding him while the little guy purred. He sure was cute, but when we left him for the night, he meowed and meowed. I wanted to bring him into the bedroom, but the dogs would leave him alone. They kept trying to sniff him, scaring him, so we left him in the living room. He finally settled down. That night, someone or something tried to break into the house. The door into the living room was pushed open, breaking the lock. The dogs at first went ballistic. Then they bravely headed for refuge under the bed. Carrie and I both ran out into the living room, and we must have scared off whatever it was. We called the sheriff, and I thought about our actions later, and we must have lost our mind, as a burglar could have easily shot us. I guess we both were thinking about animals getting in, like a cougar, and were brave because of Charlie. We didn't want anything to happen to him. We moved him into our bedroom after that. Two deputies showed up and checked everything out, but found nothing. They both remarked on a strong smell outside. They took photos, looked around a bush, then eventually left. I asked Carrie why didn't they fingerprint the broken doorknob. Her reply was, it was a good thing they didn't, as they wouldn't know how to deal with Bigfoot fingerprints. Carrie had a theory that the Bigfoot was checking in to see what had happened to Charlie, but I thought maybe he had come back to get him. Either way was bad. We sure didn't need a Bigfoot coming around, gift or no gift. In the meantime, my daughter, the photographer, had developed an interest in Bigfoot and had done a lot of research and reading on the internet about other people's sightings and experience. She said all we needed to do to keep it away was to put up a game cam or some kind of surveillance camera and we would never see it again. I thought this was kind of funny, but I did go and get one. It didn't stop one bit. But later, my daughter said I had failed to hook it up to a recording device, so no Bigfoot video. Carrie said we needed to show the Bigfoot somehow that Charlie was fine, and then it would go away. Maybe it had heard the kitten meowing that night and was worried. I was beginning to wonder how she had developed such an insight into these creatures, but maybe it was a woman's intuition. So we took to sitting on the deck, holding Charlie and letting him drag himself around a bit each evening, as the vet said this would help him develop his muscles. And I swear, if more than once, I didn't get the feeling that we were being watched. It made my hands go clammy. I was actually toying with the idea of selling the house and moving into town, though I didn't mention it to Carrie. I found out later she was thinking the same thing, but after that, the beast didn't try to break into the house again, although it did continue to leave gifts on the deck, rocks and sticks and another dead fish. Eventually, Charlie recovered, and he's now the magnificent and most gorgeous cat who rules the roost, including the dogs though Goldens are pretty easy to rule over as they're so mellow. We spent many hours out on the deck and then the yard rehabilitating Charlie, and I know the Bigfoot was there for some of that time watching from the forest. I could always tell as I would get this strange feeling of being watched. 
it always gave me the creep, and I never got used to it. I was always scared to death of that thing. As Charlie recovered, the Bigfoot visits became less frequent until the creature finally quit coming around. We not too long thereafter retired and moved to Colorado, getting a place in town with a big yard where Charlie can play all he wants. But while we were in Prescott, Charlie was never allowed outside alone. It was too dangerous with cougars, coyotes, and, well, I almost said Bigfoot, but I guess that would be wrong since that particular Bigfoot saved Charlie's life. Thanks, Mr. Bigfoot, wherever you are. You are a true good Samaritan. And the basket? It never lost its odor, so we eventually threw it away. Carrie took it to a dumpster in town as she didn't want the Bigfoot to know and thus hurt its feelings, but now we both wish we'd kept it. How often does one get a sumac Bigfoot basket? On to the next one. My name's Ryan, and I have two Siamese cats, Meowly and Growly. Yes, I know they're dumb names, but my son named them, and even though I kept saying I was going to change them to something better, the names stuck. I mean, they're Siamese after all, and deserve names of distinction. But, oh well, the cats are brothers from the same litter, and I got them as kittens in a weak moment from Petco, where the local shelter had them on display for adoption. My son was involved, is all I can say. I live in Spokane, Washington, and my cats now stay home when I go out, but this particular time, they came with me. It was an experience that I don't care to repeat, and I'm sure they don't either. I could say it was a night we'll never forget, but that somehow sounds cliche and doesn't begin to capture it. My two cat boys are both getting old now and prefer lazing around the house, and to be honest, I kind of do too. But this particular time, I had big plans, and they were part of them. I was thinking about selling my house and hitting the road for a few years, traveling and seeing the country, doing watercolor paintings, and seeing if I could make a living at it. I had no intention of giving my cats away. I would take them along. I'd read about other people who traveled with cats, and it didn't seem like a big deal. I had visions like on some social media site, me painting by some beautiful alpine lake, the cats lounging nearby on their leads, taking them for walks, sitting out, watching the stars, that kind of thing. I would go to an occasional art fair to sell my paintings, which would make me enough to live on. Was this a pipe dream? Maybe. But I'd been painting since I was a kid, and I was actually pretty good. I did mostly landscapes, and my specialty was lots of color, and I'd even do occasional animals and wildlife. I had actually sold a number of my paintings at shows, so I thought I was being well-grounded, and it was a lifelong dream, not something I just hatched up. I didn't make all that much as a handyman anyway, so I knew I could survive on occasional sales, as I was used to being frugal. My wife had left years before, and my two kids were grown and on their own, so all I had was the cat and myself to look after. It seemed doable, and even pretty simple, so why not? I won't go into the virtues of Siamese because there are few. I love Meowly and Growly, but they can be stubborn and independent and off in their own world. But wait, that describes most cats, doesn't it? And actually, even a lot of people. But they always atone for their bad behavior at the end of the day when they come up and snuggle next to me in bed, purring like they love me to no end. Though I know that, being cats, they're really just waiting for me to move so they can claim my pillow. I will say that Siamese are exceptionally smart, which ended up being a good thing this time. I'm kind of joking, because we're all attached to each other. but. 
I really think none of this would have happened if they hadn't been along. Bear with me, I'll get there. But you have to know the back story, so to speak. I saved my pennies until I could get a nice camper for my pickup, which is a Toyota Tundra. Now, if you know much about the newer Tundras, you'll know that they made the bed's side rails taller than on American pickups, and most campers won't seat into the pickup's bed like they should. Campers have a narrow bottom part that's designed to sit down into the bed. Then they flare out to provide more room inside. So, I'd bought a used Lance camper, and when I put it on my Tundra, I had to build up the height of the pickup bed so that the camper wasn't balanced on the side rails, but was actually seated down into the bed. I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but it becomes important later. So, I put several pieces of plywood under the camper to raise the bed up. Not really a big deal at all. The problem was, I bought the camper a year before I actually took off, and that was plenty of time for water to run down beneath it and start rotting the plywood, which I should have sealed but didn't. I didn't realize it, but the rot had gone into the floor of the camper as well as the sides where the tie-downs were. The whole thing was ready to fall apart. More on that later. Okay. I hadn't put my house up for sale yet, as I felt I needed to do a trial run before doing anything that permanent. I had talked to a real estate agent, and she had given me a sales number that was way more than I'd expected. So, I was pretty excited. It was just a small bungalow in an older neighborhood, though I had fixed it up. I mean, I could live for a decade or more on what? She quoted me, as long as I lived in my camper, and if I could sell paintings, I could maybe even just stash it all in the bank as a backup fund and not even use it at all. It was beginning to look like this new life was not only possible, but wouldn't even be that hard to implement. My ex was concerned, saying things like, where will you go when you're old, or if you get sick? But that's mostly why we'd broken up. She and I looked at things from opposite perspectives, though we were still friends. Anyway, Spokane's not that far from Glacier National Park, and I wanted to go someplace epic to start my experiment. I'd been there years before, and I remembered it being a really stunning landscape, a place where I would never run out of things to paint. And it was such a popular park I knew people would buy paintings of it. I could also go around to some of the galleries and shops in nearby towns and see if I could get some accounts going. So, I got all ready to go, getting food and water and making sure my truck was all serviced and that kind of thing. My daughter offered to take care of the cat as she lived nearby, but I wanted to take them as that was part of the whole reason for going to see if this would work. They would ride in their carriers in the camper, and I'd stop every couple of hours and let them run around inside for a bit. I really didn't think there'd be much trouble, and I was generally right, until later, that is. Well, the big day dawned, and I can't tell you how excited I was. It was July and getting hot in Spokane and I was ready for the cool mountains of Montana. I had my painting supplies, food, and water, and everything we needed, and as I loaded the cat and locked the house, I was walking on air. I knew my life was going to change in a big way, and I was ready for it, or so I thought anyway. I got on the freeway, headed east, at first feeling kind of nervous, but as the miles rolled on, I got more excited. I stopped every hour or so to check on the cat, and they were being so good, I decided to let them out of their carriers. They could get on the upper bunk and be more comfortable, as well as see me through the back window in my pickup, and they seemed much happier. So on we went, soon arriving in Missoula, then on to Cali Spell and Glacier. 
I was going to spend two weeks and I had high hopes of making some really nice watercolors. Now, at that point in time, Glacier in July was a zoo. I haven't been back for a while, but I would guess it's still that way, if not worse. Every pullover, every parking lot, every campground was full. I hadn't anticipated that, and I knew I was going to have problems finding a camp spot. So, after talking to a ranger, I decided to just go to the east side of the park for the day, places like St. Mary's Lake and many glaciers, where it wasn't quite as busy. Some of the campgrounds there are first come, first served, so I hoped to maybe get lucky and snag a spot. I was soon driving over the going to the sun road, and if my camper had been any taller, I wouldn't have been able to take it, as the road has restrictions. It was scary as it's narrow, but I was soon on top of Logan Pass and then on down the other side to St. Mary. Well, that side of the park was just as crazy, and none of the campgrounds anywhere had any openings. I went south towards the two medicine area with no luck, so headed for East Glacier, which is on the Blackfeet Reservation. No luck there. So I decided to go out of the park and just find a boondocking spot in the timber. I was exhausted and tired, and I didn't want to deal with anything anymore. Just go to bed. Besides, I wanted to spend some time with the cat and make sure they were doing okay. I don't know how familiar you are with Glacier, but Highway 2 the south side of the park and goes over what's called Maria's Pass. The railroad runs along there, and it's a fairly gentle path with Lewis and Clark National Forest on the side of the road opposite Glacier, as well as the Bob Marshall and the Great Bear Wilderness. The road goes through some really rugged territory, but it's a good way to bypass all the craziness of the park. Well, it was almost dark, and even though the days are long that far north in the summer, once I topped over the pass, I knew I had to stop. I pulled off on a forestry road and went back away. As soon as I found a place where I could pull off in the trees, I stopped. I have to admit that from the get-go, I was pretty spooked, and now, knowing myself a little better, if I felt that way again, I would just turn around and get out of there. But at the time, I was really tired and also worried about the cats and not wanting to subject them to any more travel on their first day out. What they ended up being subjected to later that night was definitely much worse than a few more hours of driving would have been, for sure. I was basically parked under a big canopy of tall, old-growth trees, the kind with big trunk and moth on them, and so tall you have to practically fall over backwards to see the top. I recall standing there for a moment after I got out of the cab, looking up, noting a few stars were coming out, and feeling like I was the last person on the planet. It was so quiet. I had the urge to get right back in and take off and I should have listened to my intuition. The place felt really wild. I've been in lots of wilderness, as I used to backpack in my younger days, but this felt different. I really can't explain it, except to say it almost had a feeling of uncertainty to it, and it made me want to get into my camper right away, whereas normally I would have made a cup of tea and watched the stars come out, that kind of thing. The cat seemed stressed, and I was careful to reassure them, giving them some of their favorite cat treats. They finally came and wanted on my lap, which is kind of hard to do with two of them, but I tried petting them and holding them until they started purring. I then made myself a sandwich and sat there in the dark, not wanting to turn on my inside light. For some reason, I didn't want to be visible, as if there was someone outside watching, though 
I didn't actually think there was at that point, or I would have just left, but I felt unsettled. I decided to just go to bed, feeling that my uncertainty was from being tired. I was very happy I'd chosen a pickup camper as a rig and not something I'd have to set up like a pop-up trailer. I didn't want to be outside in the dark. For some reason, I decided to sleep on the bench seat instead of the overhead bed. The bed seemed claustrophobic and like I wouldn't be able to get out fast enough if I needed to. Now, I'd camped in my rig before, going up to Priest Lake near Spokane, and I hadn't had a bit of trouble like that. But for some reason, I wanted to be down low where I could get out the door as fast as possible. If I hadn't been so tired, I think I would have put all these strange feelings together and realized there was possibly something wrong there, something going on that I needed to just get away from, whether it was just my imagination or something real. Instead, I wanted to go to sleep and get some rest. I basically passed out, and I don't know how long I'd been asleep when something woke me. A deep rumble from the distance. I at first thought it was thunder, but it was continuous, and I finally woke up enough to realize it was a train coming over the path. I slipped back asleep, half recalling some strange dream I'd been having where I was worried about something rotting in my little camper fridge and wondering how to deal with it. I woke again, not sure how much later, to the sound of the wind whispering in the tall trees all around. I'm not sure what they were, larches, maybe Douglas fir, but they were tall, and when I roused myself enough to lean on my elbow, I could see out the window. I could see them against the starry sky, bending and dancing in the wind, and I remember thinking I probably wasn't in such a good camp spot should one come down. But I was so tired, I tried to go back to sleep. The cat curled up next to me. I began to toss and turn, unable to really get back to sleep, kind of half dreaming about a tree falling on the camper. The next thing I recall, the cats both trying to get down into my sleeping bag, something they'd never done before. I knew they were cold, so I tried to accommodate them, though. I was sure they'd get squished. Later, in retrospect, I knew it hadn't been that cold, and they were scared. I must have finally gone back to sleep, because the next thing I remember is dreaming that the cats were having a big fight. They're brothers, and get along great, so this puzzled me, and when I woke, I realized they weren't fighting, but were sitting on top of me, looking out the window and yowling. That was not something I'd ever heard them do, make this yowling sound, and it made me think there was something outside. I again looked out the window, but I saw nothing. But I did note the wind was getting worse. Maybe it was time to get up and drive on, even though I was still tired, having not slept all that well. But I was suddenly wide awake as something hit the side of the camper. Both cats bolted for the upper bed, where they could get back into the far corners, away from any windows. I guess they're smarter than me, because my indication wasn't to hide, but instead look out the window. Bad mistake. I could see something standing next to the camper, and even though it was still dark outside, I could tell by its outline that it was huge. My first thought was that it was a bear, and my second thought was to wonder how could I get out and around to the cab so I could take off? And why would a bear hit the side of my camper? Had it been a branch falling? The wind had really picked up, and even without the bear, I knew I needed to get out and away from the trees. I would be safer if I camped by the side of the highway until daylight, out in the open. I needed to somehow get into the cab, but there was no way I was going out there with a bear around. My camper had a window that opened between it and the cab, and the last time I tried to crawl through it as an experiment, I'd nearly gotten stuck. 
but it now occurred to me that I really needed to crawl into the cab and drive away, sketchy as that would be. I'd hung my keys on a hook above the couch, so I grabbed those, slipped on my boots, and made sure the camper door was locked and the windows closed, then made my way to the window. I stopped, now thinking it would be a good idea to crate the cat in case something happened, so I reached up to try to catch them, but they were both in the far corners of the upper bunk, so I had to climb up there. I managed to grab them both, then slide back down, and as I did, something again slapped against the camper. At that point, both cats started clawing at me to get away, terrified. I managed to hang on to one, and since it was dark, I wasn't sure which one it was, but I got him into his crate, then went for the second. Once I had them both in their carriers, I started to put them on the upper bunk so that they would feel more secure, but I suddenly had second thought. I would push them through the window, and then they'd be in the cab with me and safer. I managed to get the window open and push each carrier into the cab, then I crawled my way in barely fitting through at one point, thinking I wouldn't make it. And so much for my favorite treat of ice cream sandwiches. It takes a lot longer to tell this than it actually took to do it, as I was moving as fast as I've ever done in my entire life. Once in the cab, I locked the back window, then put the keys in the ignition. I would parked so I didn't have to turn around to pull out, which I always did when camping as a safety measure as one never knows when they might need to get out in a hurry, though I always thought it would be a fire or something like that. Now, from nowhere, just as I was ready to start the truck, a most curious thought came to me. I was tired, it was still dark, and why in the heck would I want to drive away and find a new place when I had no idea where to go? Why not just climb back into the camper and get some sleep and then in the morning, I could sit under the big trees and drink a cup of coffee, relaxed and well-rested. There was nothing out there. It was just the wind, and it had already started to die down some. By morning, it would be a nice blue sky kind of day, and I could enjoy being in the shady timber. And what about all the wildflowers? I could enjoy them all around me, glacier lilies and lupines, and even bear grass. I relaxed thinking staying was a good idea, wondering how I'd gotten myself so worked up. Then it occurred to me that there were no wildflowers here. If there were, I would have seen them when I drove in, as it wasn't yet dark. And bear grass and glacier lilies? I wasn't much of a botanist, but I did know that those plants were more high-altitude meadow plants, not ones that would grow here in the deep forest. Now a new thought came to me. Just down the road was a really nice small lake, one full of all kinds of fish, and if I stayed, I could go fishing in the morning and have some fresh trout for breakfast. Well, I'm no fisherman, and I sure couldn't catch fish without a rod and reel, even if I were, and were cutthroat trout lake fish? I'd always thought they lived more in streams, and how did I know there was a lake? Well, what about hiking? Just beyond the lake was a nice trail that led to the top of a nearby mountain where one could see all the majestic peaks over the National Park, as well as back into the Bob Marshall Wilderness. It was spectacular, something one shouldn't miss, especially being so close. I wasn't going hiking, I told myself. There was no way I'd leave Mally and Growly alone in the camper, maybe at a campground where there were other people to keep an eye out but not out here, where I could potentially come back to find my rig stolen, or worse. I shook myself awake, realizing I was dozing off, keys still in the ignition and ready to go. It seemed like I'd somehow been arguing with myself, and yet one part of me had the facts all confused, things like glacier lilies and trout in the wrong place, and stuff like that. The cats had settled down, and were crouched in their carriers, quiet, but now, from nowhere, one of them let out the deepest, throatiest growl, a sound I've never heard them make before or since. I now had another thought, this one more unsettling than the previous thought, 
of flowers, fishing, and hiking. The thought was that I was about to die. And as I looked out in front of me, I knew I was no longer dreaming, and what I saw was something I could never describe to anyone else, since I didn't believe it myself. Later, when I did try, I realized that the majority of what I saw that night was in my mind's eye, because it was too dark to actually see anything, and my mind's eye saw something truly terrifying. All I could make out was what looked like large eyes glowing in the dark like two beams from flashlight, and at first I thought that's exactly what they were, two hikers standing in front of my truck. It finally dawned on me that what I was seeing were eyes somehow shining from their own power. Now the other cat was screaming, and I mean literally screaming. These darn Siamese couldn't see out of their carriers. How did they know something was there? They somehow knew, and their cries galvanized me from a dreamland into action. I started the truck and hit the accelerator, peeling out and nearly hitting whatever it was in front of me, which jumped back and let out a scream that made the truck shake. And just as it screamed, which was the most ungodly sound I'd ever heard, something hit my camper from the side, something hard. I thought a tree had fallen on it, but later, when I went back to get it, there was no tree. Whatever it was, it hit just as I was making a sharp turn into the forest, onto the forest road, and between whatever had hit it, the wind, and the truck turning, it all combined to make my camper tumble right off the side of my truck bed, the rotted floor and walls unable to hold it to the tie-down. Thinking back, I should have heard it crash, but there was no sound at all. I think that was because the winds were howling by then, and my ears were also ringing from the scream, and I was also beginning to think that none of it was even real, even though I saw it lying on its side as I drove away, my taillight illuminating it. I was soon back on the highway, heading down the path for West Glacier and eventually Columbia Falls. Once at West Glacier, I pulled over and surveyed the damage. My truck was fine, except for a long scratch on the side where the camper must have scraped it as it fell. The tie-downs were flapping in the wind, so I unbolted them and put them in the truck. It was dawn when I got to Columbia Falls, where I pulled into the little roadside motel. The manager was awake and said they had only one empty room, and I took it, not even realizing I was still in my long johns. I unloaded the cat and found an old cardboard box behind the motel to set up a litter box using dirt from their planter. I crawled into bed and slept for hours, finally waking around 10 a.m., the cats wanting their breakfast. There was a dollar-type store nearby, so I went in, got some cat food, as well as some sweatpants. After grabbing breakfast at a drive through I went back to the motel, fed the cat, changed out of my long john, then called a wrecker. I needed to get back up on Maria's Pass and gather my stuff before someone else came by, as well as try to recover my camper. The motel manager was a really nice gal, and after I explained to her that my camper had been hit by a tree, she said it was okay to leave the cat in the room while I went back up the path. It was nice and cool inside, and I knew they'd be much better off there sleeping. They both seemed kind of frazzled, like I know I felt. I was soon following the wrecker, and once on the path, we headed down the forest road to the camper. When we got there, I was shocked to see it had been righted and no longer on its side. What was strong enough to lift a 1,000 pound plus camper? I unlocked the door and looked around, and everything seemed to still be there, though it was all in chaos as the cupboard doors had all come open, and the outside wasn't even that banged up. Some of the fiberglass siding was smashed up, but it looked like it could be repaired. But where the tie-downs had been was all pulled out, and the floor was messed up. The wrecker guy managed to winch it back on my truck, and he ran several cables across the top and secured it on so I could get it home. 
To make what become a long story a little shorter, I went back and got the cat, had lunch, and headed back for Spokane, getting in late that night, totally exhausted. I had a couple of friends help me unload the camper the next day at a friend's repair place, and he actually ended up buying it from me as is. After what I'd been through, I had no desire to ever camp in it again. He got a real bargain, and I got rid of it. But I knew I could never get rid of the memory. I had no idea what I'd seen, and I was still puzzled by the way I'd argued with myself, trying to get myself to stay. It just didn't make sense. After talking to my kids about it, they both said something was trying to control my mind, and that this something probably didn't have my best interests in mind. Well, the story should end there, but it doesn't, unfortunately. Or maybe it's a good thing, because I finally did figure it all out, or so I think. After all this happened, even though I was back in Spokane, I kept having the thought that I should go back and take the cat with me. I could go over there and get a motel room, or I could even sleep in my truck. I kept seeing myself walking the cats on leashes around that beautiful lake with the wildflowers everywhere. It was the most comforting feeling, and it made me think of my dad once telling me about a dream he'd had of heaven. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted to go back, even though my more logical side said it probably was a vision of heaven, for that's where I might end up if I was dumb enough to return. This went on long enough that I was actually thinking of going back to see if there was such a place, a lake with flowers and all. Maybe it was my subconscious telling me I needed closure from such a traumatic event. I finally decided I had to go back. I wouldn't have any peace if I didn't go and try to figure out what was going on. After all, I'd only seen a big shadow and some glowing eyes, and maybe a tree actually had fallen, and someone had come along and helped me out later by riding the camper and removing the tree, maybe a forest worker. So, I made plans to return to that old road on Maria's path. I even decided I wanted to do a watercolor of the lake, assuming it was real. I started to get excited about it. Some of my original optimism coming back, the idea I'd have of traveling and painting. I hadn't even gotten to see Glacier National Park. But, oh boy, was my daughter set against it. She's very protective of me, and she insisted I shouldn't go. And she was really upset when I told her I was taking the cats along. She made me promise to leave them. She even joked around and said I should make out a will, though I'm not sure she was kidding. The night before I was going to leave, I felt restless and was having trouble sleeping. The cats were snuggled up next to me as if they knew I would be leaving. I finally drifted off only to have a nightmare. Something was standing at my bedroom window, trying to see inside. It was big and dark and had glowing red eyes, and it seemed like it had come to tell me something, but I couldn't figure out what. When I woke, both cats were gone, and it took me a while to find them. They were hiding under the bed. Had the dream been real, or had my own fears and uncertainties affected them? The next morning, my daughter Beth was at my door, trying to talk me out of going. She had her suitcase and was going to stay with the cat. As there was no way she would let me take them, she was carrying a map, and she opened it and said, Dad, take a look at this. I think this may have something to do with what you saw. It was a Montana Road and Recreation Atlas, and she opened it to the page that showed the west side of Glacier National Park. This isn't all that far from where you camped, Beth said, at least not if you go cross-country. She pointed to a section of the map between the Trail of Cedars and McDonald Falls that had a note that read, Alleged Bigfoot Sighting, June 2003. Now, my son Darren showed up, carrying a small pack. We decided you're not going alone, Dad, he informed me. I took a few days off work. I've been needing to get out anyway. 
I was really pleased to hear this, as I seldom got to spend any time with him, for he ran a busy wedding shop. Looks like we're going bigfooting, I grinned, though deep inside I was wondering if I really wanted him to get involved with all this. We had a great talk on the way over, stopping in Missoula for lunch. While there, Darren pulled out the map book Beth had given me. Where exactly are we going, he asked. Taking the book, I studied it. Then said, I think this little road here. I showed him a small road near the top of the path. Dad, this says Devil's Creek. Did you notice that? When Darren said that, I felt a chill come over me. Why would someone call something Devil's Creek? Had they had something strange happen there, just like I had? Was that the only word they could come up with to describe something they'd seen there? I knew these old names predated the name Bigfoot, and attributing it to the devil was a common way to describe such strangeness. I don't see any lake very close to the road. Are you sure you want to go back? Darren was now asking. We could just go into Glacier and enjoy the park. I felt very confused. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I recalled the figure at my window the previous night. Had it been a dream, was this all just some kind of strange hallucination? I don't know, I replied. Let's decide when we get closer. Well, it wasn't that much longer before we got to West Glacier. We stopped for some ice cream, but it was time to make that decision. Going to Glacier would be a lot more fun, and we could drive across the Going to the Sun Road on over to St. Mary Lake and Goose Island, and I could probably get some good photos which I could take home and use for inspiration for some watercolors. It seemed like the logical decision, but then from nowhere came that peaceful feeling surrounding the lake. I knew I had to go back and see if it was real or it was just my imagination. I knew Darren preferred to go into the park, but I felt I had no choice. Maybe we could go to the park afterwards. We were soon at the old road, where we turned and went back into the tall timber where I'd camped. We got out and looked around, but it didn't feel like anything different, just a camp spot in the trees. Let's go back in a ways and see what we can find, I said. It wasn't long before the road petered out at a small turnaround next to the creek. There was no lake, just some nice wild roses in bloom that would make a nice painting. So I took some pictures. Should we go now? Darren asked. As I poked around some, I found a small trail following the creek. Let's follow this trail for a ways, I replied. It's possible this creek feeds from a lake, but I really don't want to go that far. Darren now seemed reluctant. Dad, I really didn't want to say anything, but this place kind of gives me the creep. I really wanted to respect Darren's feeling, but something was driving me on. Why don't you wait here in the truck, I asked. I won't be gone long. Now, Darren looked panic. I'm not going to let you go alone, he replied. But I don't think it's a good idea for either of us to go. Something's not right here, Dad. I don't think there's a lake up there. I wish I'd brought my drone. I stood there as that peaceful feeling again came over me, and I wanted nothing more than to go on up to that lake. But then I recall how I'd ignored my intuition when I first camped here, staying even though things seemed questionable. That hadn't turned out well, and I'd promised to never ignore my intuition again. Yet here I was, doing the same thing again. You're right, I replied. Let's go. But now, I started arguing with myself again. I was so close. Why not go find that lake? Darren could wait here. It wouldn't take long. And if I could capture something so peaceful in a painting, it would sell really well. Plus, I would want to look at it myself. Maybe hang it on my own wall. Shoot, I could maybe do a print of it. And it would make lots of money. It would be so worth it. Now Darren had my arm and was pulling me along back to the truck. I started pulling back saying, it won't take long, I'll be back soon. 
This is my last chance. You have to understand. Now, Darren whispered urgently, Dad, there's something over there in the bushes. We have to go now. Even when hearing that, I didn't want to go. But my son is a lot bigger and stronger than me, and he pretty much strong-armed me back into the truck, quickly starting it and turning around. To the bitter end, I wanted to go back. That mythical lake drew me to it. Although I later realized there was no lake, and what was driving me wasn't what I thought. Now, Darren said quietly, and I could feel the fear in his voice, Dad, look back. I turned and looked out the back window, where I saw a giant creature, covered head to toe in thick hair, looking malevolent and holding a large stick. I knew then that my son had saved my life. I also knew it was closure I so badly needed, the knowledge that there was no peaceful lake, but that I had somehow been misled and was walking straight into a trap. And if Darren hadn't been there, I know I would have joined the ranks of those who have mysteriously disappeared in and around Glacier. He drove us back to West Glacier, where we bought a park pass, and then went to Apgar and had a snack, then drove up to Logan Pass, neither of us saying a word the entire time. Looking back, I think we were in some kind of shock. The park was busy as we hiked the Hidden Lake Trail to the Lake Overlook. I normally would have been miserable surrounded by people, but it felt good for once. Finally, standing at the end of the trail, high above the beautiful teal blue lake, my eyes were drawn in the direction of Maria's Path, far below Reynolds Mountain, Gunsight Path, and peaks with names like Dusty Star, Little Chief, and Citadel, far to a mythical lake that I still somehow wanted to exist. But I knew I'd fallen victim to either my own imagination or some kind of strange mind control. I'll never know which, but I do know that Bigfoot is real, and I also know I'll never go camping anywhere near Maria's Path again. Later, along with Darren and Beth, we worked out a plan. Beth would move into my house, taking care of the house and the cat, while I rented a place for a few months wherever I wanted to go, to paint. I would then come home and work on selling my paintings, and then, after a couple months, I'd go back out somewhere new. This would save Beth having to pay rent, as well as giving me a home base and a stable place for the two cats. And if for some reason my paintings didn't sell well enough to support that lifestyle, I would still have a home and could go back to handyman work. Darren and Beth could still take care of any maintenance the house needed while I was gone. So far, it's worked out well, and as soon as I leave my current place in Colorado, I'll go home to Spokane for a few months, then maybe go to Yosemite, which is a place I've always wanted to paint and my paintings are selling well. Sometimes, I still imagine that peaceful lake and want to go there, but I've since discovered that happiness is pretty much in how one views things, not a particular place. I've since found many beautiful places where I can find peace, and I will add that I no longer argue with myself. If things feel questionable, I trust my instincts and just move along. For now, I know that things aren't always what they seem. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, Thank you so much, and until next time, bye!